the Liberal Senator James Patterson. Thanks for joining me this afternoon, Senator. Um, what do you think of the government's commitment here to another Middle East deployment? I think it's a very sensible, very prudent and very measured contribution and I just can't understand those critics who say that Australia doesn't have interests in ensuring the free flow uh, of goods out of the Strait of Hormuz. I mean, Australia has an interest in freedom of navigation all around the world, but particularly in highly sensitive trade routes like this one. And we are merely joining a broad international coalition led by the United Kingdom and the United States and making a contribution relative to our size and capacity to do so. And look, that makes sense, but many might say, well, why aren't other countries uh, engaged in this? I mean, why haven't Canada, India, South Korea? I mean, you can go through the list. It's, it's so far only the US, the UK and Australia, the so-called coalition of the willing from uh, back in the Iraq war days. Why, given we're not a major power, we're on the other side of the world, why should we be doing this? Well, because it's directly in Australia's interest, each of those countries will have to make their own judgment about their own interests, but it is not in Australia's interest for oil or any other goods to uh, stop flowing freely out of that uh, region. Uh, and the incidences of piracy and hijacking in that area have been deeply concerning. Uh, international trade vessels that will service uh, Australia's interests have been, um, have been seized and have been held up, and that should not be allowed to happen. Um, the, the comparison you know, to the coalition of winning, willing and, and, and bigger deployments like Iraq and Afghanistan is just so far stretched from reality, it's not funny. We are deploying one plane, one ship uh, and some personnel uh, who will be uh, operating in the seas. It's just a totally different uh, scenario. Yeah, and look, it is a very limited uh, deployment. And we have had a frigate uh, generally on rotation there for other purposes in the Gulf for a long time. Is there a danger, though, with this new mission that things could escalate with Iran? Well, I think the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister made very clear at their press conference today that we are participating in this exercise only, in this uh, deployment only. Mm. This is not to be seen as Australia's participation in any wider uh, issues in the region. It's a very focused, uh, targeted uh, participation on Australia's part. Can I turn to the religious discrimination bill uh, that Cabinet's agreed to? A draft form will be produced in the coming weeks and then go to the Coalition Party Room. What would you like to see in this law? Well, David, as much as I'm keen to be as helpful as possible, I have been participating in the confidential uh, background briefings that Christian Porter has been conducting with backbenchers, so I'm a little bit limited by that. But uh, what I can say is I'm really happy with how the process has been run, how Christian Porter has led that process. Uh, this will be, as he's been saying, an orthodox discrimination uh, bill to sit alongside the existing discrimination law at the federal level that covers other areas such as age discrimination and race discrimination and sex discrimination. Uh, and I think it will do a couple of important things. First of of all, it will reassure people of faith uh, that their identity uh, is just as important as any other identity and it's equally protected at the federal level uh, and that they can freely go about their faith in this country without fear of adverse repercussions uh, against them. And I think that's really important in a society like Australia's, which is pluralistic and liberal and tolerant and which has many people of diverse faiths and no faith at all. The Attorney-General Christian Porter says this will be a shield, not a sword. Some might like you to go as far as having a sword here and uh, how that might apply, I guess, in practice. I mean, would this law, from your understanding, protect the right of someone like Israel Folau to say what he said without fear of losing their job? Well, as I said, David, I'm a little bit limited in what I can say about this law, but to your point about a sword versus a shield, there certainly are those who've advocated, for example, that we should positively enshrine the right to religious freedom uh, in federal legislation. Uh, I'm very, very wary of proposals like that. What that would effectively amount to is a one-clause Bill of Rights. Uh, it would in, in significantly empower the judiciary to make values-based judgments about where to draw the line between competing, hum, competing human rights and would effect, effectively hand over very important responsibilities that the parliament currently holds to the judiciary in a way that I actually think most Australians would regret after having done so. So this may mean, uh, coming back to the Israel Folau example, that there is no blanket protection to say whatever you like and defend it on the grounds that this is your religious view. Well, Israel Folau has avenues to pursue right now under existing law and is doing that uh, through the Fair Work Act and time will tell whether that's a successful action or mm. not. 
Uh, in terms of saying uh, passing a law saying he has a right to say what he say, uh, I prefer to think of it in the reverse. Should we pass laws that prevent him from saying what he wishes to say? I would very clearly say no. Uh, any right which the Parliament has not expressly taken away from you is presumed to rest with you as a citizen. So as long as we're not uh, preventing people from expressing their views uh, in law, then I think we're, we're striking the right balance. What about the right of a religious school to hire and fire based on someone's religion? How will that work? Well, the Attorney-General has said publicly that this piece of legislation will not deal with that issue. As you may remember, David, before Christmas, uh, the government brought a bill to the Parliament seeking to address that issue, uh, arising out of the, the Ruddock Review and the public debate about that. Uh, that was not able to achieve bipartisan support and therefore would not have passed the Parliament. And so at that time, the Attorney-General referred it to the Australian Law Reform Commission for further consideration and advice. And they'll be reporting back to the government in the new year and we'll take action uh, to address that then. So. Uh, as far as uh, the exemptions and protections that religious mm. schools currently have, that will not be changed by this upcoming Act. So this law may well say you can't be discriminated against uh, in, in an employment setting, but the next law that may come next year uh, could carve out uh, an exemption for religious schools. Well, I think Christian Porter said this law will not change the status quo. Uh, what he said is that, yes, it would be unlawful to discriminate uh, against someone on the basis of their faith, uh, but the issue you're referring to uh, typically refers to, to sexuality, and that's not dealt with in this bill. No, I'm not asking about sexuality. I'm saying uh, religion. So if, if uh, a Jewish school, Muslim school, Christian school uh, wanted to hire or fire someone because of their religious view, um, would they be allowed to do so? I'll have to leave uh, that to Christian Porter to answer, David, but as a general principle, I think most people recognise that it's acceptable for a Jewish synagogue to wish to employ a Jewish rabbi and an mm. Islamic um, you know, church to employ their equivalent faith as well. I don't think it's appropriate to force people to hire, uh, in a religious context, uh, people who do not share their religious beliefs. OK, but right now you're satisfied with how this bill is looking? I'm very satisfied with uh, all the consultation that Christian Porter has been doing. It's a fiendishly complex area of law. It will be a very long bill, uh, and he's right across that detail and all the potential pitfalls involved. What about on the industrial relations front, another area that Christian Porter with his other hat on, as industrial relations minister, uh, is looking at? Some of your colleagues have been uh, you know, venturing some views on what needs to happen here. What change would you like to see in the industrial relations landscape? I thought the contribution yesterday in the financial review by my colleagues Tim Wilson, Jason Falinski and Andrew Bragg was a very thoughtful one. Uh, what they identified is that the enterprise bargaining system uh, as it once was has effectively broken down. In the last five years, the number of EBAs that are in force in law have effectively halved. And I don't think that was the intention of the Fair Work Act when it was passed by Julie Gillard as Industrial Relations Minister, but that has been the effect. Uh, and what that means is that uh, the flexibility that employers, unions and employees have had to negotiate enterprise level agreements that suit the conditions of that enterprise has effectively been lost and now a lot of employers are resorting back to awards which in many cases don't suit the interest of employees nor employers and I think that's a, an unintended consequence and we should look at ways at addressing that. Do you think though there needs to be a better explanation or example of how the system isn't working. I mean, I, I take what you're saying there, you're right, that the number of EBAs passed has, has really fallen. But what does that mean to workers in the street wondering whether the system needs changing? What have they lost? What are they missing out on? Well, we know from uh, economic evidence that productivity gains are the best predictor of future wages growth. And if we can get productivity gains happening in our system again, then we will see wages growth as well. Uh, and an inflexible, outdated industrial relations system that effectively takes us back to the 19th century, as the Gillard Government's Fair Work Act did, uh, means that those, that flexibility at, at, for employers and employees doesn't exist. And so you have some bizarre situations where very popular agreements that are voted up by employees are very vetoed by the Fair Work Commission uh, because of technicalities. And I think that uh, doesn't serve the interest of workers and it doesn't serve the interests of employers and it certainly doesn't serve the interests of the Australian economy. Liberal Senator James Patterson, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate that. Thank you, David.